there's some exciting things that are going on. So I'm honored to be here today and be allowed to preach today with Mark being out of town. Um, Pastor Mark is in Nashville. Uh, they are having the celebration of his mother's life. Uh, she passed away a couple months ago, and so they're now able to gather. So uh, pray for him and, and uh, his journey back home. But today, we're going to be talking about the meaning of the cross. So if you turn in your, in your copy of Scripture to 1 Peter, the second chapter. But before we look at this Scripture, we first need to look at the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the center of the Christian faith. Dead center for Christianity is the cross. We look at that, that cross right there. But today we're going to look at it from three views, three different angles. We're going to look at it from, from our view, from Jesus' view, and from God's view. What does the cross mean to you? Before we can answer that, we first need to understand that we are all created by God. In His likeness, in His image, and with His character. We all were created to be holy. A child of God, without blame, and free from sin. We were created with love, by love. But sin entered. We all are sinners. Sin has separated us from God. God is holy, and He cannot be in the presence of sin. Ephesians 1.5 says, God is not forced to love you. You are loved according to His will and His good pleasure. You are loved, but God does not, is not forced. He loves you uniquely and individually. We see the cross at the moment that Jesus was nailed to it. Our view we see that, that, that piece of wood. We see Jesus. We see the beating. We see the torture, the ripping of flesh, the brutalness of the event. But we also see the lies, the deceitfulness of the Jewish leadership that did not want to change the law, the law that they interpreted. They didn't want to change their way of doing things. We feel the guilt for which Jesus went through all of this. He went through all of this for our sins. Our sins are nailed to the cross. A love so great that we cannot understand why. Why would someone go through that much torture, that much beating, that much humiliation? He did that for each one of us because you are loved so much. Jesus suffered for you. Let's look at the second view. Let's look at Jesus' view. Jesus was serving His Father, and by doing so, He was serving each one of us. His death on the cross was not unexpected. It was written in the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter and the 21st verse. It writes, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Jesus began to, to telling what was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen. And as much as Jesus was God, He was also man. Matthew 26, starting in verse 37, it says, He began... To be sorrowful and deeply stressed, distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is extremely, extreme, exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And in verse 39, Jesus fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. At that moment, Jesus was asking His Father, is it possible for me to kind of avoid this? Is it possible for these human beings to, to buy their way to heaven or to do good things or be nice people or donate and do all these works? Because He knew what was about to happen. He had, he had been shown vividly 
So Jesus as man did not want to go through the pain and the suffering. Does any of us here want to do that? Not me. Just like you and I, we, we try to avoid pain. We try to avoid suffering and hurt. And we will do whatever it takes. But here is the difference between you and Jesus. And Jesus is man. Matthew 26, 41 says it all. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The man of Jesus wanted to avoid the pain and the suffering, just as many of us would. But the spirit, the holy side, was willing to do as the father commanded. Because he knew that going to the cross, that shedding his, his blood would atone for our sins. We deserve that. We deserve to be nailed to the cross. Jesus willingly goes to the cross for you. While Jesus is, is being beaten and tortured, you are in his sight. He is enduring all of this for you. Why? It is very simple. He loves you. He loves you. He is shedding his blood. The blood of sacrifice for atonement for your sin. Because he loves you. He doesn't love your sin. He doesn't love your house. He doesn't love your car. He doesn't love your clothes. He loves you. For what you are. Not what you are. Now the third view is God's view. The cross reveals to each of us the character of God. It's very simple. One side, his love for lost sinners, for lost people. And the other side uh, is his perfect justice. They came together at the cross. Sin was nailed to the cross. His love and justice was nailed to the cross. There is no other greater love than the love of the Father. Redemption Absolute forgiveness and a new beginning. What is absolute forgiveness? Think about that for a minute. We all talk about how we forgive somebody, but do you absolutely forgive somebody? We all, there's always somebody that, that scorned us. There was somebody that scorned me in 1987 when I was a senior in high school that, I, that Satan wants to remind me of. I'm like, dude, that was 30 plus years ago. Why, why, why does it even bother me? Did I forgive that person? Probably I didn't. Absolute forgiveness means you are forgiven. It's done. It's over with. Never to be brought up again. The cross is the place where all the wounds of sin are healed. The emotional problems, the guilt, the anxiety, depression, physical suffering, tragedy, anger. And we can go on and on and on. There is healing in the cross of Christ. Keeping your focus on the cross will protect you from the many false teachings of the world. Satan hates the cross because it seals his doom. He is relentless in his attacks to undermine human abilities. Right now, Satan is promoting, sharing, spreading lies, convincing people, not just Christians, that people are not, people are not sinners. If you think you want, you want to challenge me on that, Go anywhere, turn on a television, and look at a newscast. What are they showing? They are showing hate. They are showing anger. Why? Sometimes the, the, things are being manipulated and turned and created to create this false narrative. Now, is there sin in this world? Yes. Are there people judging other people because of the color of their skin? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I take that same passion and say they are absolutely wrong. Each man, each woman, each brother, each sister. We are different on the outside. But we are 100% 100% the same on the inside. But they are not just attacking Christians. Satan is also going after people and telling people, that, they, that people are not sinners. They, are, that they do not need a crucified Savior. They are better on their own. There is not an ongoing sin problem that they need to repent. There's not an issue with people going down the street burning buildings. 
shooting people. That's wrong. Because there is. We need to love our neighbor as God loves you. All that forgiveness, all that pain, all that suffering needs to go to the cross. So as we open our Bibles to 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 24 and 25. I'm reading from the New King, New King James Version. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. All of our problems stem from one thing, from sin. Our own sin, from the sin of others against us, our, sin, our sinful reaction to that, and from the fallen world that we live in. We're all sinners. And I'll be the first to raise my hand to go, you know what, I'm a sinner. My reactions to people that sin against me is probably not the greatest reaction in the world. But the solution to our sin problem is Jesus, who was nailed to the cross. Now we hear that. We've heard it for a couple of weeks now, being nailed to the cross. Let me show you something. This is a construction nail that I use. It's actually a construction screw, but that's all right. I use this when we're putting together framing for a building. That's three and a half inches. It's got a huge tension relief. Okay? That's a nail. This is, this is about the appropriate size of the nail that went through Jesus. See the difference? A little bit of a difference. This is a bulk nail. This nail... It's, as much as I can determine is about the size that was in there. There's no point on it. It's made to drive in and stay in. Can you imagine that going through your hand, through your flesh, through your bones? That heavy nail being, being drilled down in. Each time it goes through, it, doesn't, it, it travels a short distance. The pain and the suffering through that. But the amazing thing about that nail was driven for you. When Jesus was enduring that on the cross, you were in His sights. The pain that went through. I've had these nails right here, driven through a thumb, out a nail, and it hurt. Can you imagine that going through your hands, your feet? The pain and the agony. It says in verse 24, Himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Himself. He is the only one for forgiveness. He, is, he alone took your sin. There is nothing we can do to make ourselves clean. But why did Peter say for the tree instead of the cross? It says in Deuteronomy 21, 22-23, it says this, If a man has committed a sin... Deserving of death, he is to be put to death, and you hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is assured, accursed of God. And the other, and, the, and also the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians three thirteen, Christ has redeemed us from the from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, "Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree." Both the apostles are saying that Christ took on Himself as our substitute the punishment, the death, the condemnation that we deserve. We are all sinners. We deserve the punishment. We deserve to be nailed up on that cross. We deserve to, for, to be put to death. But through Jesus, through the love of God, who went to that cross, who, who, who died on that cross, who arose three days later, we are forgiven. The only person capable of bearing your sin, my sin, everyone's sin, 
is Jesus. It's not the President of the United States. It's not the governor of this country. It's not anyone other than Jesus. Nobody can, can, can take what sin has created. When I was writing this sermon, I always, I, I use the New King James Version, but I also have a couple of reference Bibles. And something in the, in the uh, CSB, which is the Christian Standard Bible, verse 24, it says, By His wounds you have been healed. We've all envisioned and seen something to the effect of, of what Jesus was beaten with the cat of nine tails. The ripping of the flesh. We envision those wounds. But by His wounds, you are healed. Just Jesus took the punishment, the pain, the torture for you. He alone, through His wounds, has healed you. But see, here's the thing. You must take up the offer. If you choose to turn to Him, you will be delivered from the penalty of sin which God justly must impose. There are punishments for sin. Just like, well, I would say today, but um, in traditional law, if, 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 you, if you rob a bank, you go to jail. If you are... You break the law, there's a punishment. For every action, there is a reaction. This is what Peter means when he says, He who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. But that is not the end. When Jesus went to the cross, was nailed to the tree, he alone did that for each one of us. But that's not the end. Peter continues in 25 to show us that Christ's death not only delivers us from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Rather than straying like sheep. What does that mean? Straying like sheep is our past life. The life that we lived prior to coming to Christ. We tried to find purpose, but hey, you know, something caught our eye. We went over that way. This is how we used to live. And now we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our soul. In other words, Christ's death delivers us from the ongoing power of sin. We must understand the facts about the power of sin. And if there's nothing else that you get today, I want you to understand these three things. The power of sin caused you to stray continually as a sheep. Verse 25, it says, you were like sheep going astray. Peter emphasizes our continual past actions of straying. Before we turned to Jesus as our sin bearer, we were straying from, from the good shepherd, going our own way doing our own thing, thinking our own way. We were lost even though we may not have known it. We were in danger of harm and even death, although we were oblivious to it. The power of sin requires death and a new life for deliverance. In Romans 6, 8, and also in Galatians 2, 20, and for many other places it says, when Christ died, we who are believers in Him died with Him. And when He arose from the dead, we too raised to a newness of life. So the power of sin over us was broken. As I was writing this, I wrote this note. That's awesome. But really? Because here's the thing. It says in the Bible that when He arose, that we too arose to a new life. And, and, and so the power over sin was gone. But I can tell you right here that the same evil, the same sin that was that formerly controlled my life before I gave my life to Christ is still there. I don't, parti I don't uh, participate in it. But Satan's still going to come at you. Satan's still going to bring those things that your past life, those lusts, those wants, those desires, he's still going to bring those to you. 
I wrote the same evil lust which formerly controlled my life, rear up and entice me with the same force as they did before I accepted Christ. Everyone is the same way. Just because you give your life to Christ doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. We all are sinners. Jesus went to the cross because of our sin. But I want you to understand this. Being dead to sin takes place the instant that you were united with Christ. The moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are identified with Him in His death on the cross so that all the benefits of His death become yours and mine. So what this is saying is this. What the Bible says is that you know you, you, are, you are died. You died with, with Jesus and we rose again. Okay, We are identified with that. We are forgiven. Jesus went to the cross because He knew we would fall. We knew we would stumble. And He loves you enough. <coughs> and He forgives you for that. The power of sin requires the ongoing care of a great shepherd. At the end of uh, 25. But have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Peter is writing this to the enslaved people of Galatia and Asia. Who were being mistreated by their earthly masters. And without God, we are all slaves as well. We all serve an earthly master. We have a job. Do our earthly masters sometimes take advantage of us? <laughs> I'm not saying nothing about the mouse. I'm not saying nothing about him. But here's the thing. If, if our earthly master doesn't have God, then he has Satan. They may say, oh, no, he's a good person. You either have God or you don't have God. There is no in-between. Peter is telling these people that they are under the tender care of a good shepherd. Who, was, who has the welfare of all his sheep in view. Watch over, watching over and guarding each. Jesus, the good shepherd, watches over the souls of his sheep. The good shepherd, the tender, the, the tender care of the good shepherd, who watches, who has the welfare of all. All of us. He knows each and every one of us uniquely and individually. But everything He watches over, He cares for that. He loves us. In closing, I want, I want you to read this. I want you to hear this statement. God loves you just as you are. But He loves you too much to leave you that way. Listen, read that again. God loves you. He loves you right where you are. But His love for you is so much that He is not going to leave you there. He wants to heal you from the devastating effects of sin. He wants to heal you of the broken heart. He wants to heal the wounds, the devastation. He wants to deliver you to greatness. Because tomorrow is always going to be greater than today. Many of y'all journeyed with me when I went through my chemo radiation together. And every day I would get up. There was 28, 28 treatments. So every day I would get up in the morning and Lori would put on the bathroom. It would say, you know, she would do a countdown. Hey, there's 28 days left. There's 27. And there was a verse. There was an encouraging verse on there. Each day I could expect that. What God was doing was letting me know that, hey, man, Yesterday was bad, but you know what? Today, it's going to be a better day. There were some days that was true. Some days were worse. But see, the bottom line is this, is God was there to help me through there. If you've never experienced radiation and chemotherapy with colon cancer, come see me and I'll tell you the, the good and the bad. There's some choice words that I've used that I'm not going to use them today. But see, here's the thing. Through it all, God was there. Christ's death, we are, or through Christ's death, we are delivered both from the penalty and the power of sin. We must turn to Him. Him dying on that cross for you. He took that penalty. 
He took that penalty that you deserve, that I deserve, that we all deserve. But He also gave us power over sin. If you have turned to Him, it is because He came looking for you. If you do not yet, if, if you have not yet come to Him, you cannot be saved. You are not, you cannot save yourself. Let's just put it that way. If you do not come to Him, you cannot save yourself. But the shepherd is seeking you. Only Jesus can save you. Right now, He wants to deliver you from the power of sin that causes you to stray from His loving care and protection. God's arms are enormous. I heard an analogy yesterday as I was doing some studying that when Jesus, what was the length of the sideways motion or the length from side to side of Jesus being nailed on the cross? Eternity. His love for you has no end. When He was nailed to the cross, it went on and will go on forever for you. Do you have that relationship? Have you turned to Him? If you haven't, don't leave out of this room without turning to Him. Because we're not guaranteed it tomorrow. One step at a time, one day at a time. And in my case, it's one moment at a time. Because I don't know what's going to happen in, in, in 10 minutes, let alone tomorrow. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You. Thank You for Your Son who loved me so much that He went and died on that cross for me. He endured the pain that I deserve. And He did it for me. No other love is greater than we can know. It loves so much that is beyond our grasp. Right now, Lord, I thank You for this Word. I thank you for each one that's sitting in this room right now. Each one that's at home watching it on, on TV. Your love is greater. And if there's someone here right now that is still on the fence, Lord, I encourage them to get off the fence to know a love so great and awesome. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in your son's name. Amen. If you please.